Hello and welcome to this uh, third film about periodic trends. Hopefully you've seen the first two. This one's really, I guess in some ways, a summary of the other ones. And by the end of it, hopefully you'll be able to relate the number of valence electrons that an atom has to its bonding capacity and also to understand why the elements become more metallic on the left-hand side of the periodic table, but more non-metallic, or in other words, less metallic, um, on the right-hand side. Right, okay, well, if we look at what bonding capacity means, bonding capacity can have two meanings depending on whether um, the bonding is covalent or ionic. Okay, so um, if we look at all the group one elements, they would tend to form ionic compounds, as we know, because, because they're metals, what we consider to be metals, because they're on the left of this sort of stairway to boron, right? So one plus ions, two plus ions, three plus ions in group three. So depending on what charge ion you form, that is your ionic bonding capacity. And hopefully we're all happy by now, at the start of year 12, that group one elements form one plus ions, so their ionic bonding capacity is one. Group two elements form two plus ions, so their ionic bonding capacity is two, and so on. Okay. In group seven, if we're looking at ionic bonding capacities, these atoms form one minus ions, so their ionic bonding capacity is one. These form two minus ions, so their ionic bonding capacity is two. And these ones form three minus ions, so their ionic bonding capacity is three. And as we know, these elements here don't really form ionic compounds, so they don't have an ionic bonding capacity so much. If instead of ionic bonding capacity, we look at the covalent bonding capacity, so now we're looking at the non-metals over here, really, because they're the ones that form covalent bonds. Okay, now fluorine has seven, and all these elements in group seven, have seven electrons in their outer shell. So they're able to take one electron when they share electrons. Okay, so fluorine, for example, with its seven outer shell electrons, has got space for one more. That means it can form one covalent bond. Okay, oxygen, sulfur, selenium, they've got six electrons in their outer shell, so they can except another two, which means they can share electrons and form two covalent bonds. So their covalent bonding capacity, so one, two, and three. That means nitrogen, for example, when you look at a nitrogen molecule, it forms a triple bond because nitrogen has a bonding capacity of three. Now we can look at group four because they do form covalent bonds, whereas they didn't form ionic bonds so much. They've got a covalent bonding capacity of four, which we should be used to from our work on hydrocarbons at the end of year 11. Carbon always forms four bonds. That's because it can share four electrons. Okay, and finally, looking at whether things are metallic or non-metallic. So this is trends in metallicness, I suppose you could say. Right. This is a, this basically boils down to how well an atom holds on to electrons. And as you saw when we were talking about atomic radius and, well, not so much atomic radius, but electronegativity and ionization energies, that's what this was all about. Okay, so we're going to look at how this ability to hold on to electrons affects two things, the structure of substances and whether they take part in redox reactions, or rather whether they take part in reduction, or whether they will be oxidized in reactions. Okay, so if we look again at the periodic table and where we usually divide the metals from the non-metals, metals over here. Okay, now all these atoms, as you know, as we go to the top right, electronegativity is high, so bottom left it's low. Okay, so in other words, the further over here you go, the less electronegative things become, the less well they hold on to electrons, and therefore the more likely they are to release their electrons into this delocalized metal structure. Okay, so if you're less electronegative, you're more likely to let go of your electrons and allow them to be delocalized in a metallic lattice. So that's why these things over here act as metals. It's because they don't hold on to their electrons very well. Whereas on the other hand, these elements over here, they hold on to their electrons extremely well. They're very electronegative, 
So they're unlikely to release them into a metallic lattice, which is why they don't behave like metals. They hold on to their electrons very strongly. And they tend to form molecules. So, for example, you've got Cl2, because these atoms would rather not lose their electrons, they'd rather share them. Okay? If we look at whether these things become reduced or oxidized when they react, well, if you're reduced, you're going to gain electrons. If you attract electrons strongly, you're likely to gain them, so you'll be reduced. If you're not very good at holding on to electrons, you'll tend to lose them, so you'll be oxidized easily in chemical reactions. So that's it, really, for all the periodic trends in year 12. Nothing too complex there, but quite a lot of things to consider when you're coming up with your answers. So, um, yeah, there we are. Cheers.